Hello, my name is Dan Nesnick. I'm an anchor photojournalist at CHRO-TV in Ottawa. As you can see from my resume, I have some 20 years experience in the business, including seven as a news director. I even took a year off to teach broadcast journalism at Loyalist College in Belleville. Anyway, I've put together a few examples of my work, both in the field and from the desk. I'll let them speak for themselves, and I'll see you on the other side. Tonight, one last drop for the Airborne. CTV News with Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. They were once considered Canada's top guns, but by the end of this weekend, members of the Canadian Airborne Regiment will be nothing but a painful memory. Dan Nisnik reports. Jumping into history, more than 650 soldiers made their final drop today as members of the Canadian Airborne Regiment. It was an emotional time for the paratroopers and their supporters. Sort of a combination of um, being proud and also of um, sadness that we're leaving in this way. Well, it's nice to see uh, some support out, uh, you know, but it's a bit too late for that now. It stops my heart because it's, uh, it's like a funeral, you know, I mean, uh, it's a death in the family is what it is. The regiment is being disbanded following the release of two videos, one showing a drunken initiation ritual in which soldiers ate vomit and made racist remarks. The Airborne had already made headlines for the torture killing of a prisoner during a troubled UN mission in Somalia. It's the first time in Canadian military history a regiment has been dissolved in disgrace. It's led to the creation of a public inquiry and strained relations between the military and politicians in Ottawa. I think our government jumped a little bit too quick, again as usual. Prince Andrew is the Airborne's Colonel-in-Chief. In a letter, he praised the unit's many accomplishments during its 27-year history and said he was proud to be honorary leader. No mention was made of the problems that led to its demise. Without this regiment, Canada no longer has a quick strike force, something many believe is an absolute necessity. It's the second largest country in the world with one of the world's smallest armies, so it doesn't take a brain surgeon to, to determine the only way to get to the flanks is by using an airborne capability. The future of the country's parachute capability will be decided in the next few weeks. In the meantime, most of these soldiers are expected to return to their parent infantry units across Canada. Dan Nesnick, CTV News at Canadian Forces Base, Petawawa. News Line with Carol Ann Meehan and Max Keeping. Many Ontario communities, including Ottawa Carlton, are watching a Toronto courtroom battle that began today. The case challenges the decision to close Pembroke Civic Hospital. 3.30 Monday morning, and this busload of Pembroke Civic Hospital supporters is on its way to Toronto. Well, I think this shows the dedication of Pembroke residents and their belief in, in democracy. We salute you. We are with you in spirit. They came here to listen to legal arguments aimed at ultimately saving their hospital from closure. It could totally be overturned. They also may come back and tell us to start again, and I think that that is a real uh, possibility. The charter issues that we're uh, bringing before the courts um, have never been brought before the courts before, and it could certainly have impact not only in the province of Ontario, but across Canada as a whole. At issue is the Health Services Restructuring Commission's order to shut down the Civic and turn all medical services over to the Catholic-run Pembroke General Hospital by January 1st. In court, the Civic is questioning whether the Commission has such authority and is using various charter arguments to support its case. Another major factor in these hearings is governance. If it does close, the Civic wants the General to have a publicly accountable and democratically elected Board of Directors. Right now, though, the Gray Sisters, who run the General, have veto power over that board. Critics feel that might restrict certain health care services, like abortion and birth control. Well, unfortunately, the process is, uh, it's been divisive in the community. Uh, I think the governance issue is at the forefront, but I see gathering steam and of more concern to me are the long-term uh, beds. Will they be available? You've come from Pembroke today because you're also concerned about the ability of women within your community to obtain the health care that they choose to have. Those concerns were echoed locally, where Women's College Hospital is among 10 in Metro slated to close. The hearings are scheduled to wrap up Wednesday. A ruling by the three judges could come down as early as Friday. 
Dan Nesnick, BBS News, Toronto. Hit the brakes, they slow down, and then the van run into him straight on. Retelling the driver's story. Gaetan Latticeur owns the rig that hit this minivan around 11.30 Tuesday night. All three people in the van died after it burst into flames. As soon as he hit the van, as soon as he hit the truck, he said it caught fire right away. But he tried to get out of the truck and go shut it off, but it was too late. And then probably the, the battery blew up and then caught fire the rest of the van. The truck driver was not hurt. Either were his wife and son, who were traveling with him to Petawawa from Alexandria. The crash spread wreckage over a large area of Highway 17. Police closed it for 13 hours and rerouted traffic. Technical traffic investigators were called in, as were the, uh, the IDENT unit. Um, purposes of that is just so we can get our measurements and uh, take care of the scene. Police aren't sure what caused the collision. However, the van's driver may have fallen asleep since it was seen weaving across the center line just before the accident. This is the worst Highway 17 crash since 1989, when five soldiers from base Padawawa died not far from here. Dan Nesnick, CHRO News. Full military honors for a fallen comrade. He was a very good soldier. He was really uh, very professional. His mind was set from the beginning. Uh, he knew what he wanted to do. It was one week ago when Master Corporal John Ternopolsky lost his life. The 25-year-old soldier died when the armored personnel carrier he was commanding left the road and toppled into a ravine near Sarajevo. We gather to remember the life of John Turnikowski and to celebrate his life. Family was a big part of John Turnipolsky's life. He seemed especially close to his father, Bill, who was also in the military. John could always and did come to his dad to ask his advice and his direction such as when John was diagnosed with skin cancer. He phoned Bill to ask how he could best break the news to his wife. Turnipolsky was married in this church. He was due home from Bosnia in early May, just in time to celebrate his third wedding anniversary. In a letter read at his eulogy, wife Colleen said goodbye to a husband and father. We spent six wonderful years together, and during which you and I shared many gifts, and the most precious being our children. So even though you aren't present with us now, you'll continue to live, to live on through Ryan and Caitlin. Through many dangers, toils and snares. And grant us grace to entrust John to your never-failing love which sustained him in this life. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and remember him according to the favor you bear for your people. Dan Nesnick, CHRO News, Pembroke. Good evening. The Electric Circus is in the nation's capital for the fourth year, and what a production to put the large video dance party together. We go live now to CHRO's Caroline Redekop on Parliament Hill. Caroline? That's right, Dan. Parliament Hill is buzzing with activity. Thank you, Caroline. In other news, a passenger train hit a car east of Smith's Falls this afternoon. No one was killed, but five people in the car were hurt. One of them airlifted to an Ottawa area hospital. The others are in the Smith's Falls Hospital. The accident happened around 2.30 at the Holbrook Road Crossing in Montague Township. In Baghdad, the UN Secretary General has had a full day to work his diplomacy and avert a military confrontation with Iraq. As CNN's Christiane Amanpour tells us, Kofi Annan hopes to bring back a signed document that allows full UN access to all Iraqi sites. A day into his marathon mediation mission. In neighboring Kuwait, events in Iraq are being closely watched. Warnings are coming out of Washington for travelers to stay out of the region. And the Pentagon is telling journalists it won't give advance notice of any attack. CNN's Linda Patello reports now on the mood in the emirate once invaded by Iraq. 
That's News on 6 for Saturday night. Thanks for watching. Try and take in the Electric Circus tonight on Parliament Hill. Bye-bye. Fishing from 1,500 feet up. That's what the Ministry of Natural Resources is doing in the Upper Ottawa Valley. As CHRO's Dan Nisnik reports, biologists are going sky high as part of an extensive monitoring project. Fishing from the sky. With an antenna on the wing, the search is on for walleye in the water. We have 11 fish with transmitters in them uh, right around Petawawa in the Alumet section of the river. And another 10 near Arn Pryor. It's all part of the walleye telemetry project on the Ottawa River, launched by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Valley Outdoor Sportsman's Clubs. One of the things that we've found so far is that the walleye in the Ottawa River are distinct uh, species. They don't grow as fast as walleye in some of the southern lakes, and uh, it takes them a long time to mature. Yesterday we were up in the Lac de Cats area with the Iron Prairie Fish and Game Club, and we were able to find seven of the ten down in that section of the river. On this day, not as lucky. Bad weather cut the trip short, and nothing was tracked. Poor visibility and a bit of freezing rain in the, in the forecast, so we want to stay, stay away from them conditions. Last summer, $300 radio transmitters were put inside the fish. Biologists want to know where walleye migrate, and more important, where they lay eggs in spring. Generally, we go up every three weeks just to find where they are this time of year. When it comes to March, we'll probably start going up every week, and then into April, May, when they start to spawn, we'll be up on a frequent basis. The transmitters will last for two years, so the project will be repeated in 1999. Dan Nesnick, CHRO News. So that's my demo reel. I hope you saw something you liked, and I'll be in touch. Bye-bye.